Today, I would like to share on topic which I called mind games or breaking down mental strongholds. I'm going to share some of my testimony. I know we have a lot of new people and I'm not usually speaking up here, but my husband asked me to speak, so I have to obey. <laughs> yes. And, you know, there are two sides of freedom. It's like a coin of two sides. One side is deliverance. We all know it's demons coming out of a person. And another side is, is uh, demolishing strongholds, uh, which strongholds being cast down. They're usually in our mind, of course. And John 8.36, it says, Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. That speaks of casting out of demons through the anointing. John 8.32 it says, when you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That speaks of Jesus breaking down the strongholds in our mind, of a process, okay? And I went through the hard time in my life, which I'm going to share right now in a moment. But before that, I just want to share a little bit about me, where I come from, and my salvation story. So I grew up in a Christian home. I'm a PK, pastor's kid. I am a fifth generation Christian, which I just found out not long ago. I thought it was just four generations, but it's fifth. And I'm super th thankful to the Lord for that blessing to come from that bloodline of Christians. But growing up in former Soviet Union, things and Christians don't really have it easy like in America. And I was growing up in a society that rejected God that were society was atheistic, communistic, uh, they persecuted Christians, they thought it was American religion, a sect, you name it, whatever, they rejected it. And they knew that, I, everybody knows where you grew up that, hey, this family is weird and they treat you as such. Uh, go, going to school as a little girl, going to high school later on, you realize, oh, there's something wrong with you, that's how I took it. We are not normal. We are not like everybody else. And I was very angry about it because I was constantly treated as such in school. And I didn't have any friends. And I really wanted to be normal. I wanted to be like everybody else. And I was angry with God and even partially with my family. I didn't understand why do we have to be different? Why do we have to go to church? And I remember a time coming to a class in my high school year and I overheard a teacher talking about my family and it hurt me so much and it was not in a good light it wasn't a good conversation so I always felt the rejection from the society and I grew up in Moscow which is a capital of Russia it's a huge city where Christians they met only like a church um, in homes at first because we weren't able to gather in public buildings and it was just very secluded and you, you just don't have friends outside of that and this made me really sad. And I remember one day uh, it, I was sitting with my friends at home and the TV was on. We were just chilling. I thought they were my friends because I kind of took a path of away from the Lord. And I really wanted to be accepted. I really was seeking that. And I remember watching this TV and accidentally the TV show came up of an American preacher speaking and preaching a sermon with translation. And my friend so-called friend took a shoe and threw at me right in the living room and says it's your stupid religion I got so scared and I realized at that moment that I can never be like everybody else because the Lord has called us to live a different life I remember when I was 19 and it was time for us to move to the United States and the last service at my church my parents church I was standing there and I had a conversation with the Lord in my head. I said, Lord, I don't understand why they're praying. Why are they worshiping you? Why are they singing? And I had, why, why, why? I don't see anything in it. I don't even know if you're real. I was having that conversation in my mind. 
And in a split second, I remember like it was yesterday. The Lord had touched me so deeply. I felt like he took me underwater. The sound disappeared far away and he starts speaking to me. I heard his voice inside of myself. He told me, Lana, I am real. Just as simple as that, tears start rolling down my face and I couldn't like, the only thing that I could respond was, oh my God, you're real. Oh my God, you're real. But sadly, at that moment, I didn't give my life to Jesus. I just experienced Him. And I know it's not enough to experience the Lord. It's not enough to know that the Lord is real. You have to take that step and surrender to Him. And that was His next call for me. We moved to the United States and I go to this big church and I, um, there was a service the first month when we came to the United States there was a service and there was an altar call and the Lord touched me again and he challenged me Lana now I want your life and I broke down crying and weeping on the floor and my my brother my sister they were standing beside me and I was like so embarrassed (laughs) I, I I was covering myself but I knelt down to the floor and I broke down and I said the Lord I'm giving you my life and take this mess. I was empty, depressed. I had nothing going for me. I I, I was with this deep void inside of my heart. And I said, Lord, I know you're real now. Now, please take me and whatever I have and I give it to you. And that day was the day I gave my life to Jesus. And I started to walk the path with the Lord Jesus Christ. And later on, Later on, five years down the road, we got married with Vlad and I started to experience something that I have never experienced before. I moved to the new city. There was a new church. Our church was still small. No family, no friends, everything brand new, brand new marriage. I have to basically, I felt like I had to build my life from zero. And I had a very difficult time. And how many of you know that the devil will always take advantage of the lowest point of your life? Where you are the weakest and the lowest and he will, he will just like take advantage of that and hit you hard. And I was also struggling with battling and actually had some generational curses on the top of that. And so that's what happened to me. The devil took advantage of my struggles at that time when I moved here and I started to experience something very ugly and very, uh, very bad. I started to experience demonic torments. I couldn't sleep at night without nightmares, night paralysis. I remember even waking up screaming in a sweat in the middle of the night, being tormented by demons and even coming to church. It affected our marriage. Coming to church, I couldn't pray. I couldn't open my mouth. I felt like the dark demon or cloud was sitting on me and I couldn't move. It was awful. After that came hatred towards people, awful jealousy for no reason. And the devil is just, he was taking advantage of everything that I was going through. And we know that the anointing drives out demons. And the truth breaks down the strongholds in our mind. You know, the devil always will build slowly stronghold after stronghold, lie after lie in our minds. We accept this slowly but surely. And guess what? It always takes time to break it down in our minds. Amen? It's the process. And it's not necessarily the presence of the truth that sets us free. It's the application of it. And that means... We have to put in an effort, right? And that's what I started to do. I started to, we started to realize that, okay, this issue is spiritual and we have to look for spiritual solution. So we went to this ministry and overseas and the prophet prophesied over me. It was spot on about generational curses. He prayed for me and I believe that was broken. Deliverance, what it does, it unties your hands to fight for yourself. We, I know that we are humans and we're people. We always want to have, and I had that. I was like, Lord, why can't you just deliver me? And that's it, like with a snap of your fingers and everything's going to be just fine. You're able to, right? 
And yes, God is able to. But guess what? He always takes us to the process because He is God of a process. He could have created this world in one day, but He took seven because He, he is the God of the process. And the process that we go through, we become different people. We become who He wants us to become. And if we just get delivered and we don't realize that there's another side to it, we still have to, you know, renew our mind, grow. And this is example with the soap. If you have soap in your home, it's not going to make you clean, right? You just have to apply that soap for you to actually be clean and not stink, right? Same thing with the truth. Applying the truth of God's Word daily, that's what sets us free and breaks down those strongholds. Amen? The devil is always interested in building the lies and strongholds in our mind. But it's the application of God's truth that breaks them down brick by brick. Amen? So the difference between a demon and a stronghold is this. A stronghold is a house of thoughts. It's the devil's house, demon's house. That's where he lives in. And Matthew 12, 29, it says, How can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? The strong man is a demon. A stronghold is his house, your thoughts. If you cast out a demon, but you don't work on breaking down his house, you know, it, it's, it's not a full freedom. But we want our full freedom. Amen. So I started to, this is what I started to do. After I received my deliverance, I felt like my hands were untied to fight for myself. Before I couldn't, I couldn't even pray, I couldn't open my mouth, nothing. Not that it was easy afterwards, it's just I could do it. And so I started to, I had a job that I could listen to my earphones basically the whole day. And so I plugged my ears and I was uh, brainwashing myself basically with the truth of God's Word. Guess what? It was painful. Okay, when you live so long in torment, in negativity, in demonic thoughts, one positive thought hurts your mind, right? How many of you experienced that? Yeah. To come out of that, you have to put in that effort. And so I had to do that. And when I started to do that, the Holy Spirit started to work on me. I remember sitting in the parking lot of CBC when I went to college. And I was in so much agony and pain mentally because I struggled with that dark depression. And I opened up my Bible and I started to read it out loud. It was so painful to hear myself read the Word of God to myself. But that's what got me through. Because the lies of the enemy that we have to combat them with the Word of God. And something unique happens when we out loud speak that to ourselves. The Holy Spirit is starting to work because we are doing that by faith and the Holy Spirit is working with our faith. Amen. So demons, they enter quickly and they leave quickly. Strongholds are built over time and get destroyed over time. There are three kinds of state of mind that we can find ourselves in. And if you can, if you are taking notes, I would highly encourage you to do so. I'm going to have points here. So number one state of mind, a slave. That is a victim mentality. Let's take for example, Israelites, they were in uh, slavery in Egypt for over 400 years. They were slaves. They had victim mentality. They needed someone, a deliverer to deliver them. That speaks of deliverance, okay? The anointing of God comes and delivers them. So they got out of the Egypt and they found themselves in a desert. And that's number two, survivor mentality. And that is a wilderness mentality. It's kind of like you're in the middle. You're not a slave anymore, but you're still struggling. You're, you're still not victorious. You're not in a promised land. And this is where I find myself with, with the three, three years of me being struggling after my deliverance with mind renewal and breaking down the lies that the devil has placed in my mind. For all these years, I found myself in this limbo in a middle way. 
And that's not where, when, where the Lord wants us to be. Amen. He wants us to go to the promised land. He wants us to be an overcomer. He wants us to be a victorious person. And the next stage is a soldier. This is where God wants you to be. Sonship mentality. Mentality of the kingdom. Mentality of where we work with the Lord. And here's what's interesting. Look at what God said about some enemies that stayed in the promised land. You would think that we're, oh, we're finally in the promised land. We're just going to have it so good and so easy. But the Lord on purpose did something. Judges 3, 1, 2. Now these are the nations which the Lord left, that he might test Israel by them. That is, all who had not known any of the war in Canaan, this, this was only so that the generation of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least for those who had not formally known it. You know, God delivers us from bondage, but he never delivers us from battles. Right? You know why? Because God created us for dominion. If you don't have anyone to dominate any enemies, how are you going to be walking in that calling? This is what God wants us to do. He unties our hands to fight. And this is what happened to Israel as they come to the promised land and bound their enemies. And the Lord wanted them, He wanted them to learn to fight to fight for their freedom, to fight for themselves, to, to fight for the territory, to fight for their land. Amen? And that's what I started to do. I started to fight for myself. I'm like, Lord, okay, it's painful, but I'm going to trust you, you're going to fight. You know what helped me? The, like, I heard one sermon once, and the guy said, the preacher said, it takes the same amount of energy to be negative and depressed as it is to be positive and stay in faith it was so simple but profound like it spoke to me i'm like okay i guess i'm just gonna have to do that <laughs> right and since it's gonna take the same energy i'm just gonna fight and the lord just equipped me to fight for myself and i started to do that and guess what there are things that we have to be delivered from but there are things that we have to go through to learn and to become someone else amen and we have to differentiate which is which. If you're struggling with demonic oppression, that's not something the Lord wants you to go through. You have to be delivered. If you have constant nightmares, sleep paralysis, depression, deep depression, that's not something you have to go through. It's something you can receive deliverance from. But there is things in life that grow us. Some things in life that we go to, you know, this world has troubles, tribulations. And don't ask the Lord to deliver you through them. Ask the Lord to make you into that soldier so you can fight and so you can overcome and so you can become a victorious person. Amen? James 1, 2. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it as an opportunity for great joy. Just think about it. When troubles of any kind come your way, do we usually consider that as a joy as humans? No way, right? We try to run from it. But here's, here's where the catch is. If we go through stuff and the Lord builds us and makes us into more like Him, makes us strong, makes us fight battles, makes us this person that no one can take away from us, an overcomer, then we overcome things and it becomes a great joy. Amen? Not that the troubles bring joy. No, they don't. We're, we don't like troubles, right? But the potential is for joy because God wants you to overcome. Amen? I'm going to share four lessons that I learned going through my pain. Number one, recognize your enemy and face him. This is what I had to do. I kept blaming myself why I'm such an ugly person on the inside. I blamed myself. I beat myself down. And that's exactly what the devil wants you to do. She, he wants you to focus on yourself and feel bad. Oh, you're just beyond repair. And there's nothing you could do. You're just such a bad person. You're this and that. You, you hate people. You do this. And there's no change for you. And that's the devil's goal, to make you believe that. 
to make you believe that he he has nothing to do with it. Uh, God is not God is at fault. You're angry at God, and you just blame yourself. You're focused on yourself. But guess something happens when you realize that's not always the case, and that God loves you and He wants you to overcome. God is not at fault. Okay, yes, we're not innocent. We have a role to play, but we can't believe the lie that the devil wants us to believe. He is not innocent. He is the one that's pushing all these things on us. And when we recognize and face our enemy in a specific area of your life you're struggling, you can actually shoot straight, right? When you don't know who and what to shoot at, you'll shoot like everywhere and you, you'll hit everything and nothing, right? But God wants us to be specific. That's why He opened up. We were looking for solution and He showed us. He showed me who my real enemy was and it was not myself. And I want to release someone today who's listening to me. If, you're, if your eyes are on yourself constantly in guilt, shame, condemnation, I want you to realize you're not the enemy. The devil is. And you need to identify him. Identify your enemy. Number two. Seek Jesus' face more than your freedom because your freedom is a byproduct of being near Jesus. It's so easy for us like hum as humans to get carried away with our selves, our sorrow, our depression, our situation and lose sight of Jesus. Get so desperate for deliverance or healing that we forget who the real healer is because it's painful for us to uh, look to Jesus when we are so obsessed with ourselves and I encourage you to take your eyes off of yourself and look to Jesus because he is the only one who can deliver you he's the only one who delivered me amen number three allow the Holy Spirit to take your thoughts to take you and your thoughts through cleansing process by his presence and his word we have to be patient. We're giving the devil so much time, half of our life sometimes, to destroy our life. And then we are angry at God like I was. Why can't you just do it at once, Lord? It would be so much easier for everybody, right? But no, the Lord wants to take us to the process and we have to allow the Holy Spirit to do that. Allow the Holy Spirit to work with you. Give Him time, patience. Amen? Number Four, enduring suffering. Second Timothy 2, 3. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. When you become and realize that you are not just somebody, but you are a soldier in the army of Christ, your mentality shifts that you are not on a vacation you are in the army of God. We are fighting a spiritual battle, okay? And we endure suffering as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. That tells me, obviously, we all will go through some suffering, amen? And we have to learn how to endure it. The person you become through the process is far more valuable than the miracle or deliverance or the outcome we're so desperately after. Because God builds something in us and He, and that is so precious. When I went through what I went those years, honestly, I wouldn't want to take it back because I became a different person and no one can take that away from me. The Lord has grown me and He will grow you. He wants to see you be a soldier, not a victim, okay, and not a slave to demons. Amen. Let's give God the, some praise. Come on. We know that the devil's, the devil, he's working so hard for your mind because this is his battlefield. If he wins your mind, he wins the battles. But we are not going to let him do that. Amen. We're going to take back our minds, take back our thoughts captives. The Bible talks a lot about renewing of our mind. In Romans 12, 2, it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
it's very important that we take that scripture and we work with that with the Lord. And let me give you just seven practical steps on how to renew your mind. And if you want to write that down, number one, don't wait for your circumstances to change before you start changing your mind. And this is the lie that we often believe that the reason why I'm so negative and my life, it's because my life sucks. Because if my life would improve, my mind would improve. But that's not true. We cannot allow our mind to be on the level of our circumstances. Doesn't matter if we are going through poverty or we're going through hardships or sickness or anything of that sort. We can't allow our mind to drop there, okay? Because God works on the, in, like in the opposite way. He brings the sun, he brings the light before he brings the sun in Genesis, right? He, because he becomes our light. And when we have, when we have that light in our mind, our mind gets transformed before our life gets transformed. Number two, stop believing that you can't control your thoughts. And that is another fallacy. We can control our thoughts. The Bible tells us in Philippians 4, 8, think on these things. That means we have to take action. We can choose what we think on. We can choose where we gravitate our mind to. It, it takes some work, but we have to choose to do that. Joshua 1, 8, it says, you should meditate on it day and night. Psalms 1, 2, it says, on his law, he meditates day and night. And it's just to prove that we are responsible for what we think. We cannot allow our mind to wander or to, to wander into our default thinking and mentality. We have to navigate it back to the Word of God. Number three, what you feed your mind becomes your mindset. You can't control your mindset, but you can control what you feed your mind with. So when you feed your mind with the Word of God, when you feed your mind with the teachings of the Lord, this is where we learn to take our thoughts captives, ca as captives. And we can't allow them to run rampant and think whatever they want to think because our default as humans is negativity. <laughs> we, we, we default to our uh, thinking maybe, I am lonely, I am nobody, I will never get married, I will never have children, I am this, I am, I am such a bad person. That's what I was doing. And it was so hard to pull my mind towards the Word of God and to say, you know what, no, you are, I am a child of God. God loves me, for goodness sake. He said He loves me. That means I, I, I have to believe it. And I chose to believe it. And slowly but surely, my mind started to shift. Holy Spirit started to work with me. He started to, I started to experience the presence of God on me and my body. And He started to like peel me like an onion. All of those lies that I believed in my mind, He peeled that off. And that all takes process, like I mentioned. Number four, confess what you believe, not what you feel. When I was sitting in that car, confessing and reading out loud the Word, the word of God. It's very powerful. This is what it says in Joshua. And the Lord instructed Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. So now this is the instruction I want to give you. If you are struggling, let the Word of God not depart from your mouth. Not only your thoughts, but read it to yourself out loud. If you're falling or like you're in depression or darkness or something, just read the Word of God out loud it, because it does something very beautiful. It has power. We have power in, your mouth, in our mouth. We combat the devil's thoughts with the Word of God coming from our mouth. Amen? Number five, resist negative thoughts and assist positive thoughts. Bad thoughts are like weeds. They need to be pulled out, which is work, right? You pull them out one by one. And the good thoughts, godly thoughts, the thoughts of the Word of God, they need to be, they're like seeds. They need to be planted like the, you plant them, okay? And that takes time and work. And so we see this process of uprooting the weeds and planting the seeds. And it, it's never at once. It's only one thought at a time. Don't allow the devil overwhelm you right away to say, that's how I felt. 
oh, I'm so overwhelmed, I'm so negative, there's just no way I can change. No, you can, but you can do one at a time. When you catch yourself having this pattern of thinking that you were thinking like I was, I am lonely, I'm so lonely. Just change that thought, just one at a time. You know what? No, I'm not lonely. The Holy Spirit is with me. With me, He lives inside of me. I cannot be lonely. Just talk to yourself. Number six, celebrate the process. It's going to take time to see change. Take one step at a time, one thought at a time. Make a decision to never give up. And that's huge. We have to make a decision today that you will not give up you will fight for your freedom. And number seven, expect miracles. Expectation is a breathing ground for miracles. Do not, do not allow your mind to imagine bad things. I know we all probably have that. And you know, I actually struggled with that. When I just had a baby, the devil would like bring me such horrible thoughts of something happening with a baby. And my mind was just like pulled by something towards that. And I would experience like shaking of the fear. And then I had to stop, take that negative thought, capture it, recognize that that's from the enemy. This will never happen. And out of my mouth to say, no, get away from me, devil. That's not going to happen. The Lord's going to keep us safe. The Lord is our refuge. The Lord is our rock. The Lord is our salvation. This will never happen to my child. And I knew a girl who, I prayed for a girl who had constantly those intrusive demonic thoughts. When she was driving um, through the bridge, she would always have a thought, pull over and like, you know, pull over off the bridge. And it became so hard for her to drive through the bridge that it became very, very hard. And we prayed and she needed to recognize, obviously, that's demonic. The devil is playing tricks, playing games with our minds. And we need to come against that and stand against that. Amen. Expecting good, not bad to happen to us. Come on. Amen. Because the Lord is always working with our faith. Without faith, we cannot please God, the Bible says. And this is where the faith comes. We're believing for good. We're believing the Lord. We're believing that He says He is who He is. That He is faithful. That He will deliver us. Amen. Amen. Let's rise to our feet.